In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Dear Reverend Father, dear brothers and seminarians, dear faithful, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to come down and be our Redeemer. That Redeemer loved his own. He loved all those whom the Father had given him, and he loved them to the end. This was a love that the world had never seen manifested among human beings. It was a love that was total, a love that did not slacken. And if our Lord had had any other love for us, if he had had a merely human love, then he could not have been our Redeemer. It would have been too difficult. Only a supreme love could have done all that was necessary to redeem us. Because the redemption of the human race is a most difficult work. It's the greatest work in the history of the world, far more difficult than we will ever understand. And on this night, we must at least try to grasp something of its difficulty, and by doing so, understand as well something of that great love of our Redeemer for us. And there's really one thing that makes redeeming us poor human beings such an awful and seemingly impossible task, and that is our pride. Pride is like rabies. It makes you crazy. And once you've gone mad, you're no longer able to know that you need help. And you no longer want to accept the cure that is offered to you. When someone is foaming at the mouth and raving, you try to draw near. You want to help them. You have a medicine that soothes the body and the soul. And as soon as you get close, the madman jumps on you. And he starts to beat you with an insane fury. And you're lucky if you can draw yourself away and escape with your life. And this is what it's like trying to help our poor, sick, wounded human race. Ever since the sin of Adam, ever since our forefather pridefully tried to be like God, we have been suffering from this mental illness of pride, an illusion about ourselves, and an illusion about the world around us. We have that rabies of self-love, and it's a very bad case. We seem not to think that we are creatures. We're convinced that we're God. And God looks down upon us with mercy and pity in our state of sickness, in our state of madness. And he sends his only begotten son on this most difficult task, to cure our rabies, to draw near to a colony of the insane, and to treat their madness. And what happens? In a very, very short time, only in a space of three short years, we put him to death. He is doing nothing but good to us. He is the most lovable person ever known. And our response is, away with him. Crucify him. Our Lord said to the Jews, I have shown you so many good works from my Father. For which of these good works do you want to stone me? And they replied, It's not because of your good works. It's because you make yourself God. You can't say that you're God. We are God. You can't take our position. If you are God, then we can't be God. Therefore, you are not God. God came down to tell us that he is God, but we would not listen because we think that we are God. This was one of the arguments that the Jews made with Pilate. We have a law. That if someone says that they're God, we have to put them to death. 
The law says that he has to die. The evidence be damned. God can't show us that he is God. If he does, he has to die. This did not make Pilate laugh. It made Pilate fear. Pilate thought it might be true. Caesar claimed to be a god, Julius Caesar. Augustus seemed to be like a god. Other Roman emperors would later claim divine honors. Nero, Caligula. It became a fashion among the Roman emperors to say that they were God. Pilate, at least, knew that he was not a God, and he was willing to accept that a God might manifest himself on this earth. He was conscious of his creaturely status. But the Jews were not. God was there in front of them. God was speaking to them. God was claiming to be God. And in their pride, they cried, away with him, crucify him. If you crucify God, it's because you will not let God be God. It's because you are usurping the throne of God. And this is what we continually do with our Adamite pride. We exalt ourselves so high we foster our sickly illusions of greatness. We only want to hear ourselves talked about. We only want to have ourselves heard. We want everything that happens to us, everything related to us, everything that we do to be acknowledged as being special, as being extraordinary, almost, as it were, as being divine. And how very difficult this makes it to redeem us, to save us. How incurable we make ourselves. You can't medicate God because God is perfect. You can't medicate someone who does not need any cure, who already has all that he needs. This is the state that we find ourselves in often in this modern world. Nobody wants a redeemer because they think that they don't need one. They're already perfect. They don't need any help from anybody, including and especially God. You need a very, very special redeemer to save those who are infected with this Adamite pride. You need a very loving Redeemer, one who is able to love those who have made themselves unlovable. For there is nothing so unloving and so unlovable as human pride. We need a Redeemer who will not just love us, but who will love us to the end. In other words, who will love us completely, who will love us so much that he will do whatever is necessary to cure us, even if it involved difficult things and things that require long and persevering effort. And this is exactly the type of redeemer that God has given us. Or rather, I should say, this is the, exactly the type of redeemer that God has made himself when he takes flesh. Our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, is a Redeemer who, in order to cure us, practice an unceasing and relentless humility. From the very beginning of his life all the way to the end, because he loved us to the end. It all starts with his incarnation. St. Paul says that God annihilated himself. The distance between God and our human nature is so great that it's like an annihilation. Our human nature is nothing. 
It's so tiny. It's so minuscule. It's so utterly creaturely that the incarnation is like an emptying of God, a reducing of God to nothing. And God took flesh and placed himself inside of one of his creatures, a woman. And he made himself depend entirely upon her for everything that he needed. He depended upon her for his food. He depended upon her for his clothing. He depended upon her for his movement. She carried God from here to there. She commanded God. And God obeyed her. And God seemed to rejoice in this state of affairs. He seemed to love being in this position of total subjection to one of his own creatures, an unknown woman from Nazareth. He did not prolong this state to the age of 18 or to the age of 21. He let it continue many years after adulthood and he only entered into his public life after his mother more or less commanded him to at the wedding feast of Cana. My hour has not yet come. But she says, no, your hour has come. Now I give you the permission. And how many times during that public life did the people want to glorify him and he would not let them. He quickly disappeared after working his extraordinary signs. He told those who were cured, don't tell anybody. Don't report my miracles. There was even one occasion when he told the devil himself to be silent when the devil was praising him. The people were always chasing after him. They were always wanting to make him king. But he would not let them. He was always stopping them. There was only one exception. And this exception, this willingness on the part of our Lord to relax somewhat his law of total humility for himself was in order to fulfill a prophecy. And this is what the prophecy said. Behold, thy king comes to thee meek and seated upon an ass. The one moment of triumph that our Lord allows, even that must be a moment of humility because of his love for us. The one moment that we as the human race are acclaiming God upon earth, um, aren't we saying to ourselves, can't we at least get him a horse? Can't we get him at least a nobler beast? I don't ask for a chariot with an entourage of a hundred men to surround him. Can we not at least get him something a bit nobler than a donkey? No, he will ride on this immature donkey and have 12 fishermen as his attendants, as the members of his royal court. And this brings us to the Last Supper, that last meal of the most humble Redeemer with those most humble followers that he chose for himself. The love that our Lord showed us during his entire life, the love that led him to empty himself over and over again, that love would be manifested to the highest degree on Holy Thursday night, and then all the more tomorrow on Good Friday. After all the time that our Lord has spent with the apostles, they are still infected with this rabies of pride. 
that makes them blind and delusional. And it's his last night with them. It's his last opportunity, as it were, to cure them in their presence, to apply his healing ministrations to this terrible wound that afflicts them and afflicts us. The one thing that will make us lose everything, will make us lose our souls. Our Lord knows that what he does on that night will be remembered always, that it will be recounted and commemorated for thousands of years until the end of the world. And so Jesus, knowing that the hour had come for him to pass out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Because it was his last night, and because he loves them completely. These are the two reasons that St. John gives for what he does next. And we all know what that is. He rises from the table. He girds himself. He stoops down. And one by one, he washes the feet of each of his apostles. Do you know what I've done to you? He says to them. This is not an arbitrary action. It has a meaning. You are supposed to learn from it. You call me master and Lord, and I am your master. And so, if I am your master and I have washed your feet, if I am the greatest among you and I am washing feet, then you must wash others' feet. For I have given you an example that as I have done to you, so you also should do. If you know these things, blessed shall you be if you do them. This is your cure. This is your salvation. This is your beatitude. If you will be saved. Otherwise, you will be damned forever. I do not speak of you all. I know whom I have chosen. Does this cure the apostles? Does this wake them up from their sickly dreams of self-importance? No, indeed. After this great act on the part of our Lord, Luke tells us that a dispute rose amongst them. Which of them was reputed to be the greatest? Who do you think is better, me or you? I think I'm better. I'm smarter. I'm more handsome than you are. Remember what I did the other day? Wasn't that fantastic? I think our master likes me more than he likes you. Our Lord knew that this one-time washing, powerful as it was, would not be sufficient to cure the pride of the human race, to redeem the human race from its great mortal sickness. And this is why his persevering love, his love that loves to the end, had another invention that would provide for us a lasting, daily, supreme example of our Lord's humility and so also of the humility that we must practice if he is to be our Redeemer. And when we contemplate this mystery, of the Holy Eucharist. We can only be silent and amazed at our Lord's goodness to his poor, prideful, minuscule creatures. What has he chosen to do? He's chosen to come to us in the lowliest possible of forms 
under the appearances of plant matter. And not just any plant matter. This is plant matter that has been crushed and made into two different substances for our nourishment. The wheat, the wheat has to be cut down in the field. It has to be ground down in a mill until it's the fine powder of flour. And then it has to be baked in an oven at a high temperature. And the grapes, they have to be plucked from that vine that nourishes and sustains them. And then they have to be trodden underfoot until all the juice comes out of them and they are just left as a heap of flattened skins and pulp. And this is what our Lord does to himself to bring healing medicine to his wounded creatures. He hides himself under the appearances of matter that has been terribly battered. And then he asks us to consume him in that humbled state. Because he knows that our pride is so great. We will hardly ever accept him as our redeemer in any other form. God has to crush himself to come to cure his prideful creatures. On this Holy Thursday night, let us not allow our pride to be confused about the person and the teaching of our loving Redeemer, who he is, what example he leads us, and how he brings us to heaven. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over others, he says to the apostles this night. But not so with you. I am reclining at table, yet I am in your midst as he who serves. This is the example that our Lord has given us from the very beginning of his life until the very end. He annihilated himself to come into this world. He was born to a humble virgin in a stable for animals. He spent 30 years of his life in obedience to Our Lady in complete obscurity. He continually fled from all honors. He associated with the poor, the humble, and sinners. And tomorrow, he dies naked on a cross in the public view of the whole of Israel. This is the example that your Redeemer has given to you out of love for you to save you from that sickness which has destroyed and continues to destroy our human race, that satanic pride that causes us to lift ourselves above God. So tonight, as we accompany our Lord to the Garden of Olives and contemplate him smashed down flat on the earth under the burden of our sinful pride, let us thank him for his great love for us. Let us thank him that he would come to be such a redeemer for us in order to save us. I give thee thanks, we can say with St. Louis de Montfort, I give thee thanks for that thou hast annihilated thyself, taking the form of a slave in order to rescue me from the cruel slavery of the devil. And it's especially important for us priests and for those who are being prepared to be priests, who are being prepared for ordination, that we ask our Lord for the grace to be truly like him. Tonight is that night that he ordained the apostles' priests, giving them to be other Christ, giving them the power to command him call him down from heaven to be present under the appearances of bread and wine, giving them the power to renew his Eucharistic sacrifice until the end of the world. And if we want to be good priests, the whole thing is 
that we have to be like Christ. We have to truly be other Christ, not just in the possession of a sacramental character, but in the entire disposition of our souls. We have to follow the example that he gave us to embrace his spirit. We have to not only grasp who our Redeemer is and what it means to follow him, we must also grasp what it means to redeem others. How do we save souls? How do we bring them to salvation? There is no other way but the way in which our Redeemer has saved us. We can only cure souls by the virtue of humility. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make us priests like unto your own heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.